que tout le monde y est. Bienvenue, euh, bonjour à tous, bonjour à toutes. Euh, nous sommes très heureux, euh, je m'appelle marie odile Demis, c'est moi qui vais faire, euh, qui vais animer cette classe de maître euh, avec Barbara Willis-Sweet. Donc, euh, nous sommes très heureux de vous accueillir ce soir pour la présentation d'une classe de maître, donc de l'Observatoire du cinéma du Québec, au Québec, pardon, avec la réalisatrice Barbara Willis-Sweet. Je tiens en premier lieu à vous informer que cette rencontre, qui sera d'une durée approximative de 90 minutes, ça dépend combien de temps André Gaudreau euh, va poser de questions et la discussion, est présentée à la fois sur Zoom et sur le canal YouTube de l'OCQ. La séance est enregistrée et sera disponible ultérieurement sur le canal YouTube de l'OCQ. Le lien du canal se trouve dans le chat. Cassandra, qui travaille avec moi, et là, pour répondre à vos questions dans le chat, elle, elle va parfois intervenir aussi. Cassandra Dion, euh, qui... Euh, donc, elle va parfois... Soyez avisés qu'exceptionnellement, euh, tout va se dérouler en anglais. Alors, je vais poser quand même les questions en français et en anglais. Je fais la présentation de Barbara en français aussi. Et je vais résumer euh, ces, euh, ces propos euh, en français ici et là. Donc, euh, je tiens aussi à remercier donc, André Gaudreau, qui est ici, qui est professeur, euh, Philippe Marion, aussi euh, professeur euh, euh, à Bruxelles, excuse-moi, <rire> Philippe. Et puis aussi, on, a, on est très heureux d'accueillir euh, euh, Christophe Huss, critique euh, au devoir, qui euh, suit en fait, les Metropolitan Opera, les Met Live in HD, depuis les tout débuts. Donc, il a vraiment une, une connaissance euh, précieuse pour nous. Et, euh, et, et, et donc, il a vu aussi le travail de Barbara depuis ses débuts, euh, jusqu'à de, depuis ses débuts, donc, euh, au Metropolitan Opera jusqu'à maintenant. Alors, euh, bonjour Barbara. Hello. Juste un petit bonjour, <rire> comme ça, avant que je te présente. <rire> Alors, Barbara est à Toronto. Euh, en fait, Barbara et moi, euh, nous nous sommes connus en 2009, alors que j'étais responsable de la distribution internationale de son, du catalogue de la compagnie de production torontoise Rhombus Media, dont elle est la cofondatrice. Depuis, nous nous sommes retrouvés à plusieurs reprises sur différents projets de production, euh, toujours dans les arts de la scène, beaucoup dans la, dans la musique, évidemment. Donc, Barbara, en 1978, fonde avec euh, Niv Fishman et Larry Weinstein la compagnie torontoise de production spécialisée dans les arts de la scène et la musique, gagnant plusieurs Emmy Awards, Award, Grammy Awards, beaucoup de nominations aussi aux Oscars, et gagnant d'un Oscar pour la musique de film The Red Violin en 1998. Elle réalise alors plus de 25 films de danse et d'opéra des documentaires de, de musicaux, ainsi que quelques feature films, quelques euh, films longs métrages pour le cinéma. Les films qu'elle produit sont principalement pour euh, la télévision. En 2008, le Metropolitan Opera l'invite à se joindre à l'équipe de mise en image des opéras de la série du Met Live in HD. Elle réalise 31 retransmissions en direct du Metropolitan Opera, tout en continuant ses activités de production chez Rhombus Media. Elle fonde euh, récemment, euh, elle cofonde Artemis avec des partenaires du secteur de la télévision. Et euh, donc, c'est une maison de production dédiée à, à la production télévisuelle de qualité. En temps de COVID, elle assure la réalisation de captations en direct de spectacles de danse pour euh, l'Internet entre autres pour The Citadel, qui est une, une école et une compagnie de danse de Toronto. Nous allons discuter aujourd'hui en particulier de son travail de réalisation de Met in HD, en particulier du cas de Parsifal de Wagner, mis en scène par François Girard pour le Met en 2013. Alors, uh, uh, we chose, uh, je, vais, je vais aller vers uh, l'anglais maintenant. Barbara, we chose together an excerpt of Parsifal to show uh, our audience. Uh, we chose the, the ending of, it, it's a spoiler <laughs> for people who haven't seen it, it's terrible. But, uh, but we, we've shown a couple of minutes of the ending 
could you just give us a, a short introduction of, of, of what is happening, very short, and then uh, I will, uh, while I, I prepare my screen for that. <laughs> Wow. Um, well, I'm not sure exactly where you're entering into the excerpt, but the uh, the it's a it's the story of the quest for the Grail, and we're all familiar with the 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 shape of the story of the Grail quest. The character Parsifal is a at the beginning is a, a foolish young boy who who um, um, has no sense of responsibility, and he goes through many trials that teach him a lesson, and he becomes a, a noble knight and becomes redeemed and in the end um, all of the characters are redeemed in this glorious scene um, related to the grail and the holy blood that's in uh, that's in there so <laughs> it's, it's hard to summarize it really quickly um, but um, basically the redemp the glorified redemption of everybody after this very very um, um, dark but exciting exciting in slow motion tale <laughs> Okay, mm -hmm. well, thank you. I know it's cruel to 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 do such. I mean, to do that with Parsifal. I mean, with the Wagner uh, opera. So, and it's cruel because I'm going to show you just a couple of minutes of of something so so beautiful, so grandiose. So please excuse uh, me for that. <laughs> So on the screen, this is um, the person with the spear is Jonas Kaufmann, who is Parsifal himself. And the li person lying down is Amfortus, and he's had this terrible wound through all his life that won't heal. And it's about to be healed, which is part of the redemption. We, we chose this, uh, this excerpt because of the different points of view that we will discuss eventually after. I want to, before we discuss uh, Parsifal in more detail, I would like to discuss briefly the origins of your collaboration at the Met, and we'll come back at the end. 
Peter Gelb, the uh, general director, asked you to join the team knowing you had limited, uh, limited experience in live transmission. Uh, is it because of your cinematic approach to performing arts, even, even though the essence of the live transmission is to be as transparent as possible? So can you a bit explain to us a bit of the, uh, the origins of this first collaboration? Yeah, well, I had, um, I had worked as a film director and co-producer with Peter Gelb before he, was, he went to the Met. When he was at Columbia Artists, he, was, um, he had a, um, a film, a television department, and he did many, many beautiful films with the Maisels brothers about people like Horowitz and Karyan. And they're great, great intimate films with complete access. And so we were kind of, uh, when in the early days of Rhombus and, um, and when Peter was at uh, Columbia Artists, we were kind of competitor slash um, colleagues in the same region and we got to know each other that way. And, um, and then he asked me to, like, not to direct a number of things for him while he was at Cami. And then again, um, after Cami, he went to, um, to uh, Sony. He became the head of Sony Classical and um, they, were in, they became involved in many things we did, including the Red Violin. They did the soundtrack, they licensed and commissioned the soundtrack of the Red Violin with general friendship with Peter Gelb. And I think um, he, liked, he liked my style and, um, and knew full well that I had never in my life done a live transmission of anything, even with a single camera. But he's always been a risk taker. And it turned out that in on one particular year, he had um, one of his directors, it was, it was actually the second year that Live from the Met was in operation. And for the opening gala of the season, they normally just, have, um, at that point, they just um, sent the opening gala out to not 350,000 like they do now or millions of people even, but um, it was just to people in live to Times Square and to the front of the Metropolitan Opera where they have the, um, the, the, the plaza, you know. And, um, so he said, this would be a good chance for you to try it if you'd like to. And I just said, I have no idea. What if I go into a catatonic shock? And he said, well, it's not that big a deal because it's only going to reach about five to 8,000 people. I thought, That's a lot of people. But, um, and he promised me the best team in the business and which would be a safety net if I did go into a catatonic shock. And so I said, okay, I'll try it. <laughs> But um, I basically learned everything about how to do it. Not that I've yet learned everything because there's never, an, you never know enough, but let's just say that uh, with the people that were working on it with me, I learned a lot very quickly and um, was very terrified, but also even though there were only 8,000 people watching, I was terrified with just the three to five. I, I ended up um, begging for five cameras instead of three and he gave them to me for this first production. It was Lucia de Lammermoor um, and it didn't go out to the cinemas. And um, he said, if you take to it, Barbara, I'll, I'll hire you for a real one. And even though at the time I thought, I'm never doing this again, it's too scary. It's like, um, but at the end of it, you know, it's kind of maybe like bungee jumping, <laughs> sort of you get through it and you think, wow, um, the music of course is so wonderful and the people work at such a high level that I thought I'd like to be in this environment more. So okay. he offered me Hansel and Gretel, which was the okay. first one that I did, the Engelbert Humperdinck, a couple months later, I did that one. And I just, I, I was hooked. I was no less terrified. In fact, maybe more terrified as I realized what, what could go wrong and what often did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But he asked me, I think, because of the fact that um, I, I think he, he, um, he was looking for a, cin a kind of a cinematic approach to multi-camera. And I think the tradition with multi-camera is that when you have a lot of cameras, like 10, 12 cameras, you're, you, you kind of uh, the people that come from that tradition think that they cut from camera to camera and that's kind of what the architecture is. And um, for me, the architecture is like a single camera that develops um, a story within that shot and the shot remains until be just before it loses its integrity or its interest. So I always pretend, even though it's a crazy thing to pretend, I still pretend that I have one camera and I'm in the absolutely perfect position and uh, the perfect choreography to capture what needs to be captured. Given all the li limitations, it's a big imagination that it takes to, to, I think, to do that because you always have to stay out of the way of the audience and you can't make noise and you can't do retake. So I have to translate a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but thank you. Uh, basically, uh, pardon. Donc, uh, essentiellement, uh, Peter Gelb et Barbara 
Ezra se connaissaient déjà professionnellement alors qu'avant qu'ils soient au maître, ils ont fait quelques, quelques, quelques productions ensemble. Il lui a demandé de venir au maître essentiellement pour son expérience, effectivement, dans la, la réalisation de films euh, des arts de la scène, de, des, des arts vivants. Donc, c'est un gros, gros résumé. Um, OK. Um, knowing all that, in our last conversation, thank you, uh, Barbara. That was a short in translation. Our last, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think, you know, when there's too many things to say, you make it short. I mean, yeah, I go to the basics. I, you know, if, no, if nobody in the room, I, I'd forgotten that people don't speak English and uh, I apologize for that, but I can tell a couple of little things in English to summarize what I said and, and you could translate if you prefer, unless you want to move on. It's fine, it's fine. Um, Mario Di. Ça va très bien, it, okay. it's very fine, merci beaucoup. Um, we have to translate because we are in Quebec, of course. Yes, of course. Uh, you mentioned in our last conversation that doing a live transmission is serving many masters. What did you mean by that exactly? Well, yeah, it's, first of all, I do think of it as um, a service, um, a way of transmitting something to an audience in the most seamless way possible and the most accurate way possible. So that's sort of the first math. Um, it's, it's a very interesting thing because you, you need to sort of dig into the music and, and understand kind of, well, I do anyway, when I'm doing this, I dig into the music and I listen and I listen for the, what the libretto means and what the composer's structure is and, and the phrase structure, very, very important um, in terms of how to divide up the shots. And sometimes, especially with Wagner, it reminds me of a giant crystal where you can take a little, a little chisel and go ding, and the, the crystals all fall away on the fractals and you can figure out how to put it back together with shots. It's different with different composers, but Wagner, despite the fact that they're huge crystals, they're still very crystalline and clear. And um, so there's that to serve, plus the meaning and the epic quality that the, the director, or the, the composer had in mind. There's also, of course, um, if, we're, if we're focusing on on Parzival particularly, um, Alors, in uh, every case. Barbara, donc, oh, yeah. il y a les très, très, donc, plusieurs, donc, il y a effectivement plusieurs maîtres à servir quand on fait une, 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 une transmission d'un opéra comme ça, qu'on filme. Donc, il y a la musique, euh, il y a le, 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 le compositeur euh, qui a sa propre voix. Wagner ne peut pas être euh, représenté, ne peut pas être filmé de la même façon qu'un qu autre compositeur. Euh, la musique, le libretto aussi, évidemment, ça dépend de, de, de plusieurs éléments. Barbara? Yes. And I, talk, I talked also about the crystals, where you take a, it, it's like you, you take this, you find the structure of the music the way you find crystals in a beautiful, a, a, oui. the, the fractals in a beautiful crystal. The fractals in a beautiful crystal. Oui, you know, donc, that is a essentiellement, un opéra, c'est comme un cristal, et puis tu essaies de trouver, en fait, le, 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 la lumière lumière en fait sa lumière particulière donc euh, et, et particu en particulier un opéra de, de Wagner est un très très gros cristal. But there's also the 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 director um, in charge of the live production who always has a very strong vision and to be able to um, somehow elevate that so that it has um, or not elevate it but present it in such a way that it has impact on camera it's very tricky um, because uh, um, it's it's um, every time you cut it's such a huge decision sometimes you're forced to cut or and then you also have to have both close-ups and wide shots to show the grandeur but to also show the intimacy and the people's faces you might talk about that you, you Donc, chaque fois que chaque fois qu'elle doit prendre une décision en fait de montage, elle doit, ça, ça a beaucoup d'impact, ça a beaucoup d'importance. Euh, et puis aussi, en fait, elle le fait en fonction, elle va monter en fonction de la mise en scène particulière. Donc, une, une certaine mise en scène de, de Parsifal va, va l'amener quelque part ailleurs qu'une autre mise en scène. But the, but the big, the big thing too is to protect the singers themselves and Traditionally, opera um, has been populated by big people, although in this Parsifal, um, they're not big people, but you know, physically large people. And they're used to being um, standing in one place and singing and not having to be balletic or be graceful and move around. 
Um, because really the main thing with opera and it remains the main thing with opera is the beautiful, the visuals take a back seat to that. And um, so it means that for instance, if a singer has phlegm in, you know, it need, has a phlegm in their throat or their chest, they have to clear it. And you can't show that in close up and you don't know when it's going to happen. Or maybe they'll forget a line and they have to change the staging and go down to the prompt box to, to hear a line. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they're, um, they look bad from a certain angle and you have to be very careful not to go in too close. Um, and sometimes they're very presentational actors because they're used to projecting their acting out to uh, 3,000 people in a live audience. And in this case, it's very intimate. So those things have to be balanced very carefully when you plan the shots. Alors, il faut protéger aussi les chanteurs, évidemment, qui arrivent chacun euh, avec leur corps, avec leur rapport à la voix. Donc, euh, certains ont, ont besoin de, de, se, de, de se nettoyer les, les, les voix euh, vocales. Donc, ça, ça peut projeter des, des humeurs. Euh, donc, il, il s'agit de, de... Puis aussi, le corps... Euh, à l'origine, avant l'arrivée des caméras, euh, les, les, souvent les chanteurs d'opéra étaient des personnes quand même euh, corpulentes qui ne bougeaient pas autant sur, le, sur la scène. Donc, euh, le réalisateur doit nécessairement trouver le, le bon équilibre euh, pour respecter, pour protéger, euh, pour protéger le corps des chanteurs. I remember in one opera, um, there was a... Um a particular singer who was very, very famous. He had a fan club and everything. And I put in a request for him. He had to wear a hood. This was in um, Il Trovatore. And he had a hood on and his face was hidden. And when he sings, he's supposed to take his hood off and walk across the stage. And the message I got back when I asked him to take his hood off while he walked across the stage so we could see his face, he said, I do one thing at a time. I can either sing or I can walk or I can take my hood off, take your pick. That's what he said to me. Donc, essentiellement, un jour, elle a, elle a fait une demande. Il y avait un chanteur qui était sur scène qui devait, qui avait un capuchon, puis elle dit, j'aimerais je, je, ça que tu enlèves ton capuchon. Puis il dit, moi, je peux faire une chose à la fois. Je, je peux chanter, je peux marcher, ou bedon, ou bien je peux, euh, je peux enlever mon chapeau. Alors, il faut que tu choisisses ce que tu veux de moi. Barbara. But that's very old school. That doesn't happen so much anymore. And that's good because, you know, it's a, it's a total, it's a total immersion in all the arts, I think, opera and singers are, I think, learning that. And I think the, the cinema transmissions are contributing to people realizing they have to also act <laughs> and move oui, and they don't have Donc, to be corpulent. Oui. Yeah. Donc, les... Les, les chanteurs euh, maintenant doivent apprendre aussi le, 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 le jeu, ils doivent apprendre à, à, à de, ils doivent aussi devenir des acteurs. Et ils n'ont plus le même corps non plus, donc ils bougent beaucoup plus. Oui? I wanted to just add that um, to, to your original question, because I'm still trying to answer it adequately, which is that um, through all of this serving of these masters, um, um, wants to create excitement, but the minute the director is noticed by the film audience, there's great resentment because I think people want to believe that they are having a direct transmission and they want to share the risk and they want to share the excitement and they don't want any intervention by a director. In fact, many don't even think there are directors in live transmissions. They think they're actually having experience. And um, I think it's, it's interesting because I'm wondering if way back in the early days of movies, you know, people would be shocked if they saw a wide shot and then a close up and then a wide shot and then a close up. You know, in the very early days, people would go around to the back of the screen and see why the train was not cut behind the screen when it came into the station. People still think that it's happening by itself. Um, it has to be done so invisibly that they, they believe that they're really there. And at the same time, it has to be done artfully enough that they don't get bored. So it's a, that's, that's the tricky master right there, how to be artful and really sneaky about it. Oui, merci Barbara. Yeah. Oui, effectivement, tu, tu devances ma prochaine question, mais euh, euh, donc il faut, l'audience, le spectateur euh, n'a pas, ne s'attend pas, s'attend 
à aucune intervention essentiellement. Donc, il faut que le réalisateur soit invisible et euh, euh, fasse preuve de, de, de créativité pour rester invisible. C'est probablement ça le, le, le maître le plus euh, tricky, le plus difficile à, 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 à contrôler, en tout cas, à jouer avec. Um, so, so does that mean that, uh, very quickly, but uh, does that mean that each midlife in HD asks you a different approach? Because you have so many masters, you have so many, you have a different director, you have a different composer, you don't approach uh, Mozart like you would approach uh, Wagner, of course. But so those are, this is where you have one master and you have Jonas Kaufmann, but then you have uh, Barbara Hannigan. So, so, so those are all uh, different masters also that you have to, to work with. So, so is it, do you start from zero almost at every, new opera? No, no one tells me to do that. I just feel intuitively that, that it's very important that ideally every single opera would have a completely different style because, because there are such different elements in it. But I mean, even just thinking about the composer, you know, I, I always think of like with Havelier, which is, um, I think of, you know, I was talking about how Wagner is kind of like crystals actually even more Verdi is like crystals, like beautiful, and Mozart is like crystals, beautiful crystals with clear fractals in the crystals that tell you how to structure your shots. They just tell you. And then you have Richard Strauss, who is one of my very favorite composers too, but his structure and his way of carving up the music is to me like trying to figure out how a great butcher would cut up a carcass so that he doesn't damage the bones or the sinews or the meat. And he creates all these pieces that come together. So it, it's a diff in the cutting just because of the way the music is structured. And then there are of course the sets which are completely different and, and, and the, you know, the demands of different, um, different singers you know, are, are quite strong too. And they get their input um, based on one rehearsal. The one rehearsal we have, they get to look at that. And some of them are very, um, very insistent on certain things. Others don't, others don't look at it because they don't want to um, affect their performance. But quite a few of them look at, at the, one, the one rehearsal that we have, which is three days before the, normally three days before the actual show. Okay. <clears throat> Alors, uh, essentiellement, uh, uh, effectivement, chaque, uh, ben, en fait, la, la, la question, la réponse était dans la question, mais elle élabore en disant que chaque, uh, chaque uh, composeur, compositeur, pardon, uh, amène une, une, une demande, une certaine façon de monter, une certaine vitesse de, 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 de caméra, uh, ce qui est la même chose, évidemment, pour, uh, pour les, les, uh, les, les chanteurs. Uh, um, this brings me actually to, uh, to, to this uh, famous uh, Tristan Unisolde, uh, this Wagner that you have directed in 2008. This was your second, uh, uh, your second uh, uh, opera actually that you directed for the Met. And it was really badly received. That's the least that we can say, right? The uh, critiques and Meloman uh, uh, were scan scandalized by your numerous split screens. And uh, in one of our dis discussions, actually, you explained that, um, of course, you had to find an equilibrium, but it was, uh, sometimes it's harder. And in this case, uh, you had to impose, in a way, a certain cinematic um, presence. Can you uh, maybe explain uh, to us what happened, actually? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, um, well yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I was looking at um, large chunks of it just recently to refresh my memory. I haven't been able to watch it since that time because it was it was a, a very, very um, I still think it was a need a different style for every opera. This one, the director, the, the stage directors and designer from Germany had done this, what I think is a beautiful painterly set, it's, but it's extremely two dimensional. Um, so you watch it and nothing is realistic. Like there's like a ship and there's these washes of color and the, the people in it 
um, were pretty well all extremely heavy, <laughs> heavy physically. And also almost all of them were in silhouette for a big chunk of it. Um, so you couldn't see very much that felt um, interesting cinematically, in addition to which they did, they would send aria. If this is the stage, they'd be, one would be standing, oops, I'll try to do this. One would be standing here and one would be standing here. And it's a beautiful painting, but they don't move. And they're, and you can't tell if they're facing upstage or downstage. So, and also there was no, um, with the way the set was set up, there was no possibility for putting a dolly across the front of the stage because it, it protruded. So it really limited what I could do. Uh, do you want to translate that and then I'll continue? Oui, en fait, uh, ce qui se passait, c'est que uh, le, le, la mise en scène était très, était, en fait, n'avait pas de profondeur et uh, 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 les, les, les silhouettes, les corps eux-mêmes étaient assez corpulents et ne bougeait pas en fait la, la mise en scène faisait que c'était très minimaliste en fait comme 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 mouvement comme mise en scène c'était aussi pas réaliste non plus. Yeah. Alors, um, so I thought, and this goes back to the whole idea of the intervention of the cinema director, the the film director, whatever you call it, whatever you call me, but. Um, I thought because we're because now TV screens are very big at that point, even that point, which was a long time ago, and the cinema screens were very big. I thought, why not um, uh, do it in multi screen in such a way, certain points, and, and kind of transform themselves in size. So we might see the, the, the panorama of this lovely painting and then. Um, for the for the bottom of the screen, and then the top of the screen could be divided in three between three people in close up who were singing, who were singing a trio or were singing back and forth. It and um, also people were definitely um, assaulted by that. So I thought just because of the way we watch sports and the way we watch TV now with all like and we watch multi screen movies, I thought I thought maybe audiences would like it as something interesting, but. Oh no, they didn't. But Peter Peter Gelb was really encouraging me to do it, and he and he he told me afterwards that we're not going to be able to do the do these boxes. He called them again, but um, because of the response. But he really loved me for doing it and for pushing it through. And um, I have to say, Mario Deal, that Wagner's granddaughter wrote me found me and wrote me a letter saying this is the right approach for Tristan. So she. Oh. That, wow. that made me feel a little better. <laughs> Maybe. So, so, alors, je vais, uh, je, vais, je vais traduire un peu. Uh, en fait, son approche, vous avez compris, à cause de la, la mise en scène. Uh, aussi, en fait, il y avait quelque chose, de, de, un peu de la peinture. Donc, elle, elle, elle a voulu mettre um, uh, certaines, uh, créer des tableaux en fait, prendre des, 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 des éléments de, de la scène et en faire des tableaux, puis rajouter l'un après l'autre des, des écrans. Euh, Peter Gelb, qui euh, bon, l'a supporté dans sa démarche, a quand même dit euh, « je ne veux plus de ces petites boîtes », mais elle, elle a quand même euh, la, la grande, la, la, la petite petite fille, je pense, de Wagner aurait écrit à à Barbara pour lui dire que c'était ce qu'il fallait faire avec un Wagner, avec Wagner, que c'était en fait approprié à ce Wagner-là. But I honestly thought that after that happened, I, I had to get on a plane that night and go to um, go somewhere else. And I, I got, when I arrived at the other end, there were all these angry letters telling Peter Gelb to fire me. And I was on a couple of operas and I'll never, I'll probably never do them again, but at least I tried. And I was surprised that, um, I got asked back for many more, so. Mm. <laughs> oui. Yeah. Donc, euh, oui. Donc, elle aurait reçu plusieurs lettres euh, de, de lui demandant, de, demandant à Peter Gerv, en fait, de la mettre à la porte, mais elle a continué euh, tout de même. Uh, we might come back uh, with André and, 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 on, on this question a bit further, but uh, um, time flies, and I would like to talk a bit about uh, Parsifal. Uh, this Parsifa that was a, a mise en scène of François Girard, uh, mostly after discussing this uh, scandalous uh, 
Wagner. So maybe something like uh, seven years later in 2000, 2000, 2008, you are literally praised for your work on Parsifal. You explained to me that you found a place of restraint trying to use a, at minima your cinematic tools. Do you think this is the reason critiques applauded your work, anticipating the coming of a new art form? That's a big question, right? <laughs> well, first of all, I don't think, I, I, don't think well, I found actually, restraint. I don't think I, think, I think I always had both restraint and excess whenever it's needed. So it wasn't a matter of, um, well, I, I suppose when I did, I, I was pretty um, naive when I did um, <clears throat> Tristan because it was just my second one, but, and I'd been through many more by the time I, I, uh, I saw, I, I worked with <clears throat> Francois on, um, on Parsifal, but it's interesting, I, I should just mention that um, I did a presentation in Montreal for the Art Summit, uh, the Council for Business and the Arts with Peter Gelb, and <clears throat> we talked about Tristan and Isolde. And, um, Francois Girard, who I'd worked with already and on the red violin and was a friend, was in the audience and he hadn't seen Tristan, but he saw the excerpts and he said, well, I really think this was the way to go and I really hope you'll be able to do my Parsifal when I do it, because he knew then he was going to do it. So he gave an affirmation of it too. He didn't want to do it necessarily in split screen, but he could see that that was a solution for that kind of an opera. Of course, we showed the parts that worked best for the excerpts. <laughs> alors, uh, alors, uh, en fait, pour elle, c'est pas nécessairement une question de 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 de, de restrain, de, de de retenue. C'est plus une question de s'adapter donc uh, à, à l'opéra. Mais elle était très naïve quand elle a fait son. En fait, elle commençait uh, avec le Tristan, donc uh, elle a appris depuis. Mais semble-t-il, quand quand elle avait présenté uh, à François Girard ce projet-là, entre autres à François Girard. Il aurait dit que donc cette idée d'écran de, de, partagé aurait été une bonne solution pour cette mise en scène là, pour cet opéra là, lui aussi. But um, just to talk a bit more about, I remember um, him like he approaches his his theatrical. He does a lot of theatrical direction as well, and he approaches everything that he creates that I know about as if they're a single shot of a camera or something like that. So already his, his Parsifal, even though it's five hours long, never made a cut in it, in my opinion. So, okay. yeah. Donc, essentiellement, en fait, François Girard, quand il fait ses mises en scène, il les imagine comme une... Uh, do you mean that he, he sees it as uh, already a, a film? Do you think he no. makes, François Girard makes his mise en scène in, 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 in thinking them as if it was a film? Not so literally. I just think his imagination is cinematic. <laughs> Donc l'imagination dans la réalisation de, de François Girard est uh, cinématic, filmic en fait. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, so it, it um, I know he, he and I had many conversations once, um, once he was working on Parsifal and he said ideally I would, I would just never cut. <laughs> now that's not possible, but it's possible to, um, and actually desirable to be restrained because there's so much happening in the frame at any given moment in the Parsifal that if you, you just hold the camera there and the way he designed, the way the set was designed, you can see foreground, middle ground, background, and everything is kind of moving in depth like with the raked stage, which is slanted up, the camera can look up along it and see people in the foreground and the background, um, and then see this big, big, glorious sky that has billowing. The, the sky alone tells the whole story of, mm -hmm. of act one and act three. Act two is in hell, so it's not, doesn't have a sky, but. Donc, uh, François Girard, quand ils discutaient ensemble de la, de la, la, la mise en image de son, de son opéra, il se disait, ça serait bien de, de le filmer sans jamais couper. Euh, donc, dans un long plan qui n'arrête jamais. Ce qui est virtuellement, en fait, ce qui est impossible. Mais c'est quand même ce qu'elle a essayé de faire. Euh, mais c'est... Sa mise en scène permet, permettrait, en fait, d'avoir une... 
une approche comme ça de, de, en continu à cause de, de, de la profondeur des, et à cause de, des plans qui se succèdent et aussi à cause de ce, de, de, des projections qui, qui en elles-mêmes en soi euh, racontent l'histoire. Barbara? Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, the way the set was laid out was extremely friendly to the camera. Like, see if I can show you here. So if this is the, okay, say, imagine that the bottom of the screen, of my screen, is, is, the, is the front of the, of the stage. And then the stage rakes up like this. And then there's a big sky back here, which is always animated and, and expressing the drama. And on the front of the stage, like right, sec here, right here, is a rail with a dolly camera, a robotic dolly camera that goes can go back and forth. And the guy controlling it on joysticks and pedals and everything is two floors below, um, below the orchestra pit. And so it turns out that this camera that's mount mounted here can actually be when it looks along the stage, it's so fantastic because that sort of this, this post-apocalyptic dry bombed out landscape becomes a texture that's always in the foreground of every shot because it's shooting along that shot, along that landscape. And then on that, there are people placed in depth and they can, and it's so dramatic against that sky. You don't get that kind of design in very many operas i mean they can be grand but it's just so ideal for the camera and okay, the now i have to translate a little bit okay. so, so basically uh, this <laughs> C'est ça, je vais le faire moi-même avec... Alors, vous ici, vous avez... Mais euh, non, en fait, euh, ce qu'elle explique, c'est que la scène... Euh, la scène euh, euh, était montée, en fait, de telle façon à, 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 à permettre une, une approche, à, à rendre... Euh, à rendre les, les prises de caméra euh, dramatiques, à dramatiser, en fait, le... le le, ce qui serait transmis au cinéma donc, euh, et, et c'était en particulier intéressant parce qu'il y a cette caméra qui était sur le bord de la scène et qui, 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 qui avait cette euh, vue en plongée sur toute la scène et sur le, 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 le ciel en arrière qui était, qui, qui était vraiment très, très, euh, très expressif ouf, voilà <rire> Barbara you know, there are all... Also some places where in the, like in, to see in its full effect, because it all takes place, it's flat. And it takes place in a big pool of hundreds and hundreds of gallons of what looks like blood. It's supposed to be blood. And so you can't see over the lip with the camera, but that's when the, the, um, the jib shots that are on the side, like I can see, I can see down into the blood and the reflections in the blood and the which the audience in expensive seats in the front don't even see the blood. They just see the blood on people, but they don't see that they're walking around in a pool of blood. So there are some advantages and the, uh, of the camera there. And also in act one and three, um, particularly in act one. Attends, je vais... oh, just okay. one moment. I will explain very briefly, please. Alors dans le, le, le deuxième okay. acte, donc yeah. euh, ça a lieu dans une, dans une, une, une piscine en fait, de, avec du It's sang. About... Et puis Four. donc... Un... It's about four inches of blood. Ah oui, quand même. Hein? Il y a quatre, oh, euh, quatre pouces. Et donc, sur le bord, normalement, donc, la petite caméra qui, qui, qui est robotisée, qui se promenait, donc qui prenait des, des, des prises de vue en, en, en plongée, ne euh, pouvait pas, puisqu'il y avait un rebord de quatre pouces à peu près pour, pour empêcher le, le, le sang de tomber. Donc, là, c'est là que la caméra devenait importante. Donc, elle, elle a utilisé vraiment les grues. Il y a deux grues de chaque côté sur le parterre qui permettent d'avoir des, des vues en plongée sur euh, l'action la, dans la piscine de, de sang essentiellement. Barbara? Yeah. Also, in Act 1, there's a, a, a stream that runs down the middle of this, um, of this slanting desert. And um, sometimes the, the, the stream is, is made of blood. And it's hard to see that from the audience, but it's it's really great because we can we can use the jib to come down and, and see it up close and and then when it transforms in act three into spring water from blood, 
again, this stream, we can see the water change from blood into, into um, I mean, people in the audience can see that if they've got opera glasses and that sort of thing. But, um, and, but you wouldn't see it as well as you could with the camera where you can really see the construct uh, the construction of the real water. <laughs> yeah. Donc c'est intéressant parce qu'en fait euh, la caméra yeah. comme dans la comme dans l'acte 2 donc la, la caméra l'intervention de la caméra permet de voir des choses que les gens assis en, euh, dans la salle ne pouvaient pas voir nécessairement. Elle donne l'exemple dans l'acte 1 et l'acte 3 donc il y a il y a il y a un, une petite rivière un ruisseau euh, de sang qui devient dans l'acte dans le troisième acte qui vient un ruisseau d'air d'eau de, de, pure, donc c'est assez difficile à moi, quand tu es assis dans l'audience, de voir, à moins que tu aies des bonnes lunettes, des, des jumelles, la lorgnette, et euh, dans ce cas-ci, avec la caméra, elle a vraiment été capable d'aller chercher, euh, voilà, des éléments. Oh, Maybe, uh, if, if you have, uh, uh, before uh, we go to some questions, I think you could, you could go, uh, um, uh, you could go forever, I, I think, uh, on Parsifal. Um, so do you think, actually, that you did um, find, uh, I know, I mean, it's the, the ultimate question, but did, that you did find uh, the balance and that in, in the subsequent uh, operas that, that you've done at the Met, that you you went on on this idea of, of being this, this passeur, maybe, between uh, the, the opera and the cinematic experience. Did you refine this, uh, this state of equilibrium? <laughs> um, hmm. every, every one of them is different. Every one of the operas is different. It's so different. But I think accumulating uh, like 33 of them in 10 years helped me um, find uh, find my own language I suppose in order to transmit the opera in each case um, in a way that is um, true to the perception I think I mean some are way more difficult than others and I think even though it was long I think that the uh, Parsifal was one of the most most um, successful in terms of the transmission from from my point of view like in terms of how it makes me feel when I watch it I don't usually watch them afterwards but um, I have watched that one because I just am so in love with that music mm -hmm. and it just really carries me into some other state. It's so amazing. But I mean, all of the operas have amazing music. So I would say, yes, just step by step, um, a vocabulary develops by going into the music, going into the work, into the vision of the work and just um, not trying to impose anything on it. Try to get it to, like, if I can't get an idea of how to do it, I just listen and listen and listen. And it eventually tells me, listen and watch, listen and watch, listen and watch. <laughs> the, 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 uh, the archival shot of the dress rehearsal. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, essentiellement, oui, uh, ben, en fait, chaque opéra, comme on le dit depuis le début, chaque opéra est différent, mais... Mais petit à petit, après 30, 30 opéras, on trouve son propre langage, sa propre signature. Euh, ça pourrait être une autre question. Mais euh, et son, on développe un, elle développe un, un vocabulaire euh, qui, qui demande à ne pas s'imposer, mais qui, qui demande peut-être juste à raconter. C'est moi qui, ra qui rajoute ça. Euh, et ça, ça vient en écoutant, en écoutant, en regardant, en re-regardant re et en écoutant encore et encore. Um, and also, you learn, you learn, um, I, I mean, what does develop is, um, over time, they reduce the numbers of cameras that we're allowed to have at the Met, so they're fewer and fewer and fewer. Um, and okay. also, um, yeah, you, you learn... Um, sort of what looks good on a certain stage set and what looks good from certain positions because we were, um, they stopped allowing us to to buy, to, to set the cameras up in certain seats that were the most expensive in the department, they have to buy those seats. And you know, some of those seats are many hundreds of dollars per seat. Mm. So we had to com compromise our positions, but I sort of learned what the positions look like 
and and uh, like from almost every place in the hall that we've been allowed to put the cameras. And then, you know, you can figure out if a set, if a set has no, um, you know, uh, has a very flat stage, a level stage, then you know that the low angle cameras are not going to work. The low, the, the cameras that are down low at the front um, are not going to be able to see people's feet on the, on the stage. So you learn the, like the, the hall itself becomes your instrument, your visual instrument, because you know kind of what suits, you know that with a certain type of set, you can't, you can't do the jib up and down um, looking to, because they'll show, the wings will show and all the background stuff will show. In other ones, they hide the wings. So there, there, there are many shortcuts that you develop in getting to know the physical space of the Metropolitan Opera Hall and where you're allowed to put the cameras, where you, my instrument, which is the hall, plus the cameras. Yeah. En fait, avec le temps, on apprend à, à placer les caméras aux bons endroits euh, et à savoir quelle mise en scène, en fait, quel placement de caméra va, va fonctionner avec quel type de mise en scène. Euh, et on apprend à travailler aussi avec la, la maison elle-même, avec la, la salle, avec... Euh, et puis, bon, avec le temps, ils ont enlevé des caméras, euh, ils, leur ont, ils ont enlevé des, des, des endroits, des, des placements de caméras, parce que c'était des sièges qui étaient très, très... Euh, qui rapportaient beaucoup. Et puis, euh, how many cameras do you have now? Um, uh, it, it, it varies. You have to make a very convincing case for more than eight. OK. Yes. OK. Alors, euh, merci. Merci, euh, Barbara. On va passer aux, aux questions. Euh, je vais vous demander si vous voulez poser les questions directement. Sinon, vous pouvez passer par le chat. Euh, vous pouvez poser les questions en français, puis je vais les traduire à Barbara. Alors... Euh... Moi, j'ai 25 questions, mais ah, je vais laisser Christophe oui, euh, la préséance à notre invité spécial. Christophe, d'abord, bravo. Euh, Barbara, pour votre présentation extraordinaire. Bravo, tu peux y traduire, mais je vais parler en anglais tout à l'heure. Mais Christophe, à toi la parole. Christophe, donc, critique, euh, je, je pense que c'est pas comme ça que tu veux se présenter, mais en tout cas spécialiste de, de la musique au journal Le Devoir et qui a suivi pas à pas tous les opéras du maître qui ont été présentés dans les cinémas, ce qui m'a permis à moi de me faire une... de, un, de, de me payer une un panoramique incroyable sur le plan historique, sur tout ce qui s'est passé au, euh, dans les cinémas à partir des opéras du maître. À toi la parole, Christophe. Merci, André. Tu peux, tu peux le euh, dire en français ou en anglais comme tu veux. Hein? Oui. Euh, Est-ce que Barbara me comprend si je pose la question en français? Uh, it depends how complicated it is. No, I, it, I will be, it, will be, it will be very easy. So if I can ask in French, so you, you answer in English, it will be uh, easier. Ma question, c'est à partir de quel moment okay. avez-vous euh, avez commencé à vous sentir confortable? C'est-à-dire, on a parlé du Tristan de 2008, où vous étiez à votre deuxième essai. Effectivement, c'était un, un, un cas très, très problématique. Euh, Parzifal, c'est un peu comme un aboutissement. À partir de quel spectacle vous avez dit « Ah, je me sens à l'aise là ». C'était quand et quand avez-vous eu ce, cette sensation I never ever felt comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, it's because it's, that's part of the thrill, right? It's so terrifying. You never know what's going to happen and you, you can never be fast enough to answer if they don't hit their mark or... Um, so in that sense, I suppose I became comfortable with the terror, with the fear, <laughs> and kind of got a little bit addicted to it because we go into it together. Maybe it's a little bit like going into battle, except no one dies, except in the story. You know, it's like you're so dependent on each other. Like if I started to feel a lot of love and gratitude to the team, and maybe that's when I started to feel more comfortable with the with the the unpredictability and the inability to control it, but all, all of us together focusing on everything when anything might go wrong, like, um, and always, every 100% of the time something went. But um, uh, so I started to feel that way um, maybe by 
opera number 10. <laughs> And I'm just guessing because I don't even remember which one that was, but I started to feel sort of affection and gratitude rather than, you know, it, it was a tough, a tough place for me to enter. The, the camera union, for example, all the unions at the Met are amongst the strongest and most macho of all of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a newbie. I'd never done this before. And I was a girl and I was from Canada. So it was very um, important to be strong, but not, but also be, be positive. And that took a lot of energy, but I think people started to support me more knowing that Peter Gelb wanted me there. And they started to, started to um, be like, like the cameramen were very, very hard on me, very hard on me because I have a different approach. I'm sort of more do you need to translate this or? Oui, rapidement, essentiellement, elle n'a jamais été confortable. No deal. <laughs> mais pour faire ça simple, uh, et, uh, yeah. mais, mais éventuellement, à partir du dixième, à force de travailler avec les gens, puis de, de créer un, des liens, uh, elle s'est vraiment, elle a commencé à, en fait à, à se sentir plus à l'aise, à, à confronter sa peur devant le, 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 le travail à faire. Yeah. Um, so. At, at first, it, it, it's just, I have a different approach than TV cameramen are used to. And I think I, like I wanted every shot to be counted so that I could get to the end of it by the, by the end of a phrase so that it would feel elegant when it stops. And I would often, you know, want to cut it very precisely to do with how the, the music is, the line of the music or when, when to go, you know. And so I was controlling every move. And I think that the tradition in with these great TV cameramen is to kind of be constantly bailing the director out of trouble. You know, like they just, they just get to do their thing within much broader parameters. And I think that wasn't so much that I, I just wanted to see what I wanted to see. And I didn't know how else to do it except to put strong reins on the cameramen so that they would do exactly what I told them. And eventually mm -hmm. they accepted it, but it took, maybe it wasn't 10 operas, but it was quite a few operas before they stopped rolling their eyes and, you know, make, and, and uh, ja like elbowing each other when they weren't pleased with something I was telling them to do. And that was a little difficult to, to deal with without screaming at them. And I decided I would just be strong and true to what I saw in my imagination. And, um, it worked out and they all, and they've become friends. I've hired, many of them I've hired to do other projects in the States. Alors, uh, en fait, la difficulté au début était surtout avec Since, les, like, les, outside of. Donc la difficulté était avec les caméramans, surtout parce que uh, ils sont pas habitués à, à une, une réalisation qui est aussi contrôlée. Elle voulait que chacune de ses prises soit très, pr elle précisait, elle avait une, une, une idée très précise de ce qu'elle voulait de chacune de ses prises de caméra. Puis bon, uh, les caméramans n'étaient pas nécessairement habitués. Et le fait qu'elle soit femme aussi, le fait qu'elle soit canadienne uh, était assez problématique, mais éventuellement ils ont compris son approche et puis ça s'est très bien passé. André, est-ce que tu as une, une de tes mille questions? Ah, oh, monsieur Huss? J'en ai vraiment une deuxième qui me semble vraiment importante sur, sur le parcours, euh, puisque il y a eu pour moi un deuxième cauchemar après Tristan, ça a été la damnation de Faust. Et j'aimerais savoir comment vous analysez la damnation de Faust et quels sont les défis liés à une production qui est en elle-même très technologique Comment filme-t-on la technologie et quels sont les pièges pour filmer la technologie Did you, did you get that um, I, I think so. Um, like, and I have to say that Robert Lepage is also a great filmmaker, um, as is François Girard, but the difference is that when when Robert does, does um, his, his opera projects, they are almost impossible to film. <laughs> and it's impossible to find the magic that he finds on, on, on stage. Um, and and uh, I mean, it's the same with his ring cycle. Uh, you know, you've probably watched all of the ring cycle on, on, in cinema and, and I was there throughout the, t I, didn't, I didn't do that. Gary Halverson did all the ring cycle on, in cinema and D Gary did a great job, but 
to be in that hall, um, it's a very different thing with that weird machine, you know? The weird machine disappears into the imagination when it's in the hall. Like it, I mean, it becomes all the things that, that um, he, he's evoking with it. And it's, it's a magical experience for me anyway, when I've seen it live. But when I watch it in the cinema, um, it's, I'm impressed with the machinery and with the singing and with the ideas. And often I just want to close my eyes and listen to the beautiful music, but then the machine makes big loud noises and it makes it difficult. So it's, it's a, a real challenge to turn the genius of Robert, Robert's stagecraft into cinema. Yeah. Alors, euh, merci Barbara. Donc, c'est très, très difficile essentiellement d'amener de, 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 le, le génie euh, de mise en scène de, de Robert Lepage au cinéma parce que ce qui est la machine qui, qui, qui se fond dans l'histoire sur scène reste très présente au cinéma. Donc, euh, euh, c'est très, très difficile. Ce, ce qui, ceci explique cela. Monsieur Huss, est-ce que... Vous avez une autre... Je laisse à André, là, là, parce qu'il en a quand même oui. beaucoup. Il trépigne. <laughs> Thank you. I will start by scandalizing Christophe, maybe. Can I just hear what Christophe said? Like, can you translate for me? Like, uh, after his comment. No, no, he, he, just, he, uh, he, he was saying that he was uh, letting André uh, talk and he will come back probably with another question. Because I see André, <laughs> I see André, so he's like... Oh. Uh, like a child. André is so excited. <laughs> I, always, I always move. Uh, first, I will start, start uh, maybe by scandalizing Christophe. Maybe not. But I have to, uh, from my seat, from my siege, I have to uh, 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 congratulate uh, Barbara to have had the audace, what is the audace, audace of doing, of doing what she did with Tristan and, and his old. First, I didn't see, <laughs> what? Even though it didn't really work, it could have. Well, well, I know it didn't work, but maybe I, I, we know why. I'll try to explain that. But first, I didn't see all the shows, so I, maybe my, my judgment is not good, rightly based. But what I've seen is very interesting. But I think it's very interesting to see why it didn't work. Uh, I think it didn't work, and I think, well, it didn't work for the operatic uh, institution, but maybe it would work for the cinematic institution if your proposal would come from the, uh, the cinematic, cinematic institution. But the problem with uh, the transmission of uh, the opera in the cinemas is that If you think about it, let's say, let's try to respect the operatic system. How do we film that? Maybe someone would say one shot from the, you know, from the center and no, uh, only one, one uh, plan sequence, one shot uh, and nothing else. But then someone would say, well, people have lorgnette. So maybe you could have some, you know, stroke of lorgnette there and there, but you would never have from the wings, okay? Etc. So, and then someone would say, well, why don't, why aren't we free to circulate around a little bit like you, well, like, like it is this way? And we, 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 we submit the operatic work to a kind of cinematization. Okay. And I think it is funny to see that Tristan Isolde didn't work because, in fact, they don't say that, but it was ultra cinematization which may be right for people like me outside from the uh, operatic uh, 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 world or sphere institution. Because in fact, when you see Christian Isolde, it reminds me of sometimes of Eisenstein. It reminds me of, you know, kind of maybe what, what some cineasts would do. But in fact, the, uh, the, 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 the work you have to do You, maybe you don't, they don't give you the right to go, to go that far. In fact, they, you could say also, but why do they accept that I circulate a little bit, uh, uh, a, 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 a slow cinematization or, or regular cinematization is accepted? I think I would say it's because cinematic language as uh, as uh, uh, as custom, uh, uh, as accustomed us to 
slow pace, uh, editing, and you know, circulation. But with the other one, with the uh, two is old, it uh, doesn't work. In fact, you are in between lab and the course, the course uh, your work is in between. Because in fact, Wagner is Wagner is Wagner. Then you have Lepage or uh, 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 who has to interpret Wagner. But then you arrive, you or uh, Gary Alvorsen, and you have to propose your interpretation of the interpretation by Lepage or uh, uh, Girard of uh, the Wagner uh, opus. So, but the fact is also that you're not recognized as much as uh, beholding the, you know, the, 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 the right to do what you want, especially when you see that on the cast sheet, no one is mentioned never except uh, 2017, 18. But normally, what, what is the discourse of Peter Gelb? Because Peter Gelb, I think he talks, in French we say, the deux côtés de la bouche. He talks from the two, two sides of the mouth. Because in fact, what he does, he says, look at the cast sheet. In the cinemas, you will see what is there. There's no one, there's no filter. Gary Alvoson is not there. Uh, Barbara Will Sweet is not there. They're not mentioned. But in fact, it's funny because as soon as the generic, uh, the credits arrive, your name arrived and the name of Gary Alvoson because you take back the, 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 the power. But that's a real complicated, it's a real complicated uh, situation. And I don't, I don't think there is a, a real solution because in fact it's opera and the opera brings its brow to uh, the cinema and it has to respect maybe the operatic world because the operatic world will, will say boo, boo, like they did. So I could continue a long time, but that's enough. So it's not a question, but maybe your reaction on that. And also one thing, I always suspected that the uh, Le Page or uh, the, the Metteur en Scène has, signed, has to sign with Peter Gelb a clause saying, I swear on God, I will never criticize or interfere in the work of the uh, uh, filmmaker, you. Is that or not? Est-ce que vous voulez que je, trans que, que je traduise tout ça, Monsieur Gaudreau? Um, I don't know about <laughs> Non, parce que, parce que je l'ai dit de manière uh, très franco, uh, puisque mon anglais n'est pas parfait, donc je crois que tout le monde a compris. Très bien. Barbara. I don't know about anything being signed. I know that in the case of both François and Robert, and well, uh, most of the directors, um, yeah, even the first ones, I'd, I'd say all of them, and I responded to their comments. So um, we talked a lot before all, with all of the directors. I mean, sometimes the directors weren't around because they were old productions that have been revived. So, but when it's a new production, a lot of dialogue between the, um, the, the film and the, and the director, if they're interested. I mean, sometimes they just didn't, weren't interested, but in most, I, I'd say 90% of the cases, I, um, I would talk to the director with new productions and with old productions, we'd spend a lot of time with, this, with the staff stage director to go through what, um, what the vision of the stage director was um, so that we would know, but then we could uh, things. So, um, Robert was, uh, it was funny, Robert Lepage was, um, was very sweet about, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing turning, well, well, with Damnation en Faust, that, it may be after Damnation that I started to become a bit more comfortable because I realized that that particular opera, you know, he's talking about the, the beginning of cinema with the galloping horses and, 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 uh, and this animation and all these like interactive things. And I thought, wow, this should work really well with film because he's dealing with film in it. Like film technology is part of his imagination, part of the magic in his imagination. And I realized it kind of clashed. And I think up until Damnation uh, de Faust, I was probably really trying to figure out how to get in there and really get inside that vision and realize, no, I should stand back more should stand back more and not try to get inside so much. I don't know if you're going to translate that, but. Oui, merci. Uh, donc, uh, elle a parlé, en fait, avec la plupart des, des, des metteurs en scène. Uh, C'est très important pour ceux qui le voulaient. Uh, 
euh, en particulier, euh, bon, évidemment, Robert Lepage et puis euh, François Girard, qui sont eux-mêmes des, des réalisateurs aussi. Euh, et, et elle répondait, donc, s'ils avaient des remarques à faire, elle, 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 elle y répondait, donc elle, elle, elle prenait en considération. Euh, pour le page en particulier, pour répondre aussi à, à, à la question de, de M. Huss, euh, elle a commencé à se sentir plus confortable après la damnation de Faust parce que la damnation elle-même, cette mise en scène de Robert Lepage, euh, intégrait des éléments cinématographiques. Et donc, elle s'est rendue compte que c'était très difficile de, 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 de faire ce mariage de l'opéra du cinématographique plus un autre, une autre médiation cinématographique. Si on veut. Donc, c'est là qu'elle a commencé à se retirer un peu. Uh, Monsieur, do, do you want to. Uh, yes, I, no, I really want to, to say something about Tristan because uh, we cannot speak about Tristan about, uh, without speaking about the production. And the production of Dito Dorn is a stylish production, Janssenist, dull production, where nothing happens during four hours. So what do you do during four hours? Everybody here, except Barbara and I, so excerpts. And even François Girard was very happy, so excerpts. So the point is, what do you do during four hours? And there you have the, po the point and the problem of being invisible or being artful. And in this kind of production, you have to be artful and you have to create a new product. And from what I understand, Barbara was in, his, in her second, second uh, film. Oh. And, and that she has not, she had at this time not enough uh, experience to make something of it. I, I have another example in another theater, which is uh, Traviata of Musbach in Aix-en-Provence, I think, where absolutely nothing happens. It's a flashback of the life of Traviata. There is a screen and an empty stage. So what do you do? You have to do something, something else. You have to make something artful. And this had to be the case with, with uh, the, the, the Don Tristan. And it, it came too early in your, in your uh, way with the Met, I think. I think that's a very astute observation. I'm impressed that you said that because I think um, I, I do think that that production of Tristan, I, I think I said it at the beginning of our chat today, I think that production is very beautiful but it's so two dimensional and so abstract and so static that it forces you to really, and it forces you to really listen to the most beautiful music ever written in my opinion. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's not a problem when you're in the live theater, but it, it, it's, yeah, it's trying to, and, and when Peter asked me about it, Peter Gelb asked me about it, I said, the best thing I could think of to do, it, it's too bad we can't do it in multi-screen or something like that. And he went, and he hadn't offered it to me yet. And he said, well, if you want to do it in multi-screen, I'll pay a lot of attention to it and I'll give you a lot of publicity. I, I said, I don't want publicity. <laughs> he said, but I, I said, if you, don't, if you don't want to do it, I want to use your idea at the screen and I bet you anything it would have been worse. <laughs> Just because- okay, Peter Gelb. Uh, uh, yeah, Peter, Peter Gelb was so Gelb, excited. He was so excited about the idea of bringing something interesting to this um, non-cinematic, a rendition of an opera, you know, so it, you're right. And, you know, if I were to do, I don't know, I, I would do it very differently now, but I still think it was, it was the right idea. I just needed another crack at it. You know, we had one rehearsal and all those traveling boxes and everything were live, right? So not only was I doing my second, only my second opera, I was also directing where the boxes should go and, and, and all that. It was way too complicated for anybody, but I was too naive to realize how complicated it was going to be. Be, you know. Do you want to translate that? Alors ça a été guerre de repère. So, uh, mais Peter Gelb a beaucoup supporté donc Barbara dans cette idée de faire un multi-screen. Puis c'était très beaucoup trop compliqué en fait l'idée d'avoir de faire d'avoir ces boîtes qui se qui, qui se multipliaient en fait dans l'écran euh, alors que ça fait en direct qui était produite en direct alors que c'était son deuxième opéra en direct. 
Est-ce que euh, André, Philippe Marion peut-être a une question aussi et d'autres gens aussi? Il euh, n'y a pas juste euh, dans le chat, je ne vois pas de questions. Mais... En attendant les questions, je vais en poser une petite. I'll try one, uh, come back on one thing. How does Peter Gelb deal with you or you with Gelb about the, the invisibility of your name on in the cash sheet, etc. Did you ever evoke that? And do you talk about this with uh, Gary Alvorson or not? Because it's kind of a uh, bizarre. No, I never talked to him about it. And um, I mean, there is a prominent credit at the end, but nobody knows ahead of time who's doing it, you know, who's directing it. Sometimes that can work to one's advantage. <laughs> but um, no, I never talked to him about it. And it always, uh, you know, it, it, um, I have a feeling it has to do with attitude that uh, this is a service and he wants people to think of it as a, a direct channel from the live stage to the film audience. But this is, But at the same time, as you say, he's speaking out of two sides of his mouth because he wants it to be very exciting and very original and very... So I think it's, um, I, I think more and more it's become the former, it's become a service. It's harder to do um, things which, which are, um, which add something. I mean, what, when I say add, like elevate it, tr try to do the things that are, um, that the camera can really, and like what I was saying about the, about the stream of water that, that, that was blood and turns into, like the camera can capture that very effectively. Um, I was, you know, I feel like in, that it's harder and harder now um, to do something original that is also invisible. And I think with Tristan, I was trying to do something original and had no idea about invisibility because it was the second one, you know, about needing to be very secretive about doing something artful. <laughs> yeah. Oui, donc, euh, non, elle n'en a jamais parlé avec, euh, avec euh, Peter Gell. Et euh, en fait, essentiellement, c'est de plus en plus difficile d'être créatif. Euh, de... Monsieur euh, Huss. Yes, uh, my question would be about Parsifal. Uh, and uh, what I noticed in my review is that uh, the, the shooting and the movie uh, was real, really an added value because I, I saw the show in the hall and I saw afterwards um, in, in the movie theater. And uh, especially with all the blood because I was at the parterre and I, saw, I didn't see as well Uh, all the thing with the blood. So, uh, which are the three operas you would think that the filming them, filming the production, uh, did really add something to the production? Which which three would you would you think of? Um, I think that. Um... Enchanted Island, the Enchanted Island. Mm -hmm. I think um, I, I think I really liked a lot of things. I, I liked the production, but I also loved just things like the floor lights at the you know those little old fashioned floor lights on the on the stage at the beginning. They were just these like we I got I got permission to light them from the back so we could see them as foreground and when the camera comes along like along the stage uh, like down low we could use them as foreground and go past them and. I feel like, um, and, and then the um, sort of the forced perspective, Baroque forced perspective in the set, I think worked very well on the, um, do you hear me? Am I, it says my internet is unstable. Yeah. Do you, yeah. Okay. Well, okay. It, it goes, it goes and, and yeah. So it's hard to, it's, it's hard to know exactly where I've added something or where I've just had a wonderful experience. Another one, like, but I think I, I feel like we added something there And I feel like we added something, we, I, we, whatever. Um, maybe in Satyagraha by Philip Glass. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Une dernière question. Don't be thinking, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm thinking of others now, but um, yeah. Thank you. Maybe a last question and, and I think we... Uh... Mm. Oh, I have another one. I have another one that I think I really like 
the the way it turned out. And again, this is something. It was um, the Puccini, uh, uh, um, the Western, the the uh, Girl of the Golden West from mm -hmm. um, Puccini. Um, and again, the reason why I loved it, it was the way the set was. But at the beginning, um, when the set was built, um, it had a and, and it was an old production. There was a a pillar right in my favorite angle. <laughs> And Peter Gelb agreed to change the design of the set on the morning of the transmission to, to make a, 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 an elbow, like a, a, a buttress and make this, the pillar come down here so I could get a better view. And so every time I see that shot, which isn't with the pillar in the middle, it makes me really happy. So I like, the, I like, that, I like that opera for, for the way the set is and the way it, um, it worked with the, uh, with the camera. It's interesting because uh, it's interesting what you're saying because the, the, everything that you like, it's, it's really, all the operas that you like are related to the set itself, the way it was set up. Uh, there is a strong relationship between your eye as a, as a director and, and the setup. Of course, it's normal, is the visual approach. Yeah, but it's also because some of them are just so um, impossible to wrangle with the camera. That's why. And then other ones like, like Parsifal is just it just wants to be filmed, you know, and it, it's it's uh, it's hard to calculate it ahead of time. You just sort of see how it looks when you look through the camera and then hopefully your shot the shots you've planned work. So those were several that I thought the shots worked in. <laughs> I have a question here. Um, ask you if, if you would prefer to work with no audience for live captation. It would give you more leeway. Would it? Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's a very different thing because I mean, such a big part of what we have to do is capturing the audience's response at the end and oh God, the bows and all that. That's the most stressful part actually. The bows and getting everybody when they stand up and making sure that we've in the beginning, making sure we don't only show old people. We have to find kids and young people and we can't show any empty seats. And so the audience and the hall itself is a big part of the stress. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't think it would work without an audience there, to be honest. I think that um, that's part of the of the risk. Of the uh, Martin, I mean, it would be great if we could have. Ça, ça fait partie, donc essentiellement, ça ferait partie du risque, mais c'est toujours très difficile de filmer le, 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 le public. Uh, mais Martin Bolduc, qui pose la question, uh, demande, dit essentiellement, it would not serve the opera better. So, so you have to have the audience, obviously. André, uh, do you want the... the... Is this the Martin Bolduc that I know? Martin Bolduc, ah, the, oui, the one I know? Yeah. Hi, Martin. <laughs> He's probably muted, but uh, I have no picture and no sound from Martin, but I have his name. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, you know, it's funny because I've, I've been doing live streams since COVID of, of death for the internet. And, and oh, hi, Martin. Hello, <laughs> Thanks for coming on. Hi. <laughs> um, I, and I, they're without live audiences, but you still, um, It feels very different, actually, just sending it out through a lens, uh, sending it out through cameras. I mean, the great thing is you can take any camera angle you want. You don't have to spend $5,000 buying out the seats behind it, you know. But um, I think I can't imagine doing an opera without the audience there, unless I did it non-live. I mean, then you can turn, you know, like this. Le, le seul moyen de faire un, 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 une captation sans, sans public, ce serait de le faire en différé, en fait, pas en direct. Est-ce que peut-être une dernière question ou deux dernières questions, le mot de la fin peut-être, euh, je pense que, et M. Hus et André euh, Trépigne toujours, M. Hus? Non, André, il n'a pas posé beaucoup de questions, André. Moi, ouais. j'en ai une, mais... Ben, André, il euh, y, y a eu trop de questions, mais... Euh, on, je pense que je vais faire le mot de la fin vu que le, le oui. temps avance. I'll do the, 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 maybe the ending word, uh, saying uh, that it's fun, that uh, it's interesting that uh, Barbara talked about the pillar because she is uh, herself one of the pillars of <laughs> the transmission in the uh, Met Opera. So uh, we want to thank her and uh, congratulate her for her very interesting work, even 
you know, from all these years, she's been, you know, enhancing uh, her capacity of doing this. And I think we enjoy it uh, a lot. And it's uh, interesting to see that it's inscribed in the history of the, uh, of the transmission of opera that began in 1907, or even before. So thank you very much. Merci. Merci, André. Thank you. Merci, Barbara. You're welcome. Merci, Christophe. Thank you. Merci, Christophe. Merci, oui. Martin, que je ne connais pas. Merci à tout le monde. Merci à Joël. Et bien sûr, à... Merci, Marie-Odile. Ah! <rire> Comment? Merci, Marie-Odile. Oui, merci, Martin. Marie-Odile, merci beaucoup. Good to see you, Barbara. Okay. Merci, Christophe. Nice to see you too, Martin. À la prochaine, merci. Happy for me. I will for sure. Thanks. Bye. Au revoir. Au revoir.